Chapter Three of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Three. Wide is the seat of the man gentle of speech. Instruction of Kijemni. On the second day after my return to New York, my Aunt Caroline Knox called me up on the telephone. There are reasons why I always feel myself at a disadvantage with Aunt Caroline. The first of these brings me to a trifling matter that I should have set down before, but which I have made a habit of ignoring so far as possible in both thought and speech. As was Lord Byron, I am slightly lame. I admit that is the only quality in common. Still, I like the romantic association. Now, my limp is very slight, and I never have found it interfered much with things I cared to do. In fact, I am otherwise somewhat above the average in strength and vigor. But from my boyhood, Aunt Caroline always made a point of alluding to the physical fact as often as possible. She considered that course a healthful discipline. My nephew, she was accustomed to introduce me. "'Lame since he was seven. "'Roger, do not scowl. "'Yes, run over trying to save a pet dog, "'a mongrel of no value whatever.' "'Which would have left some doubt "'as to whether she referred to poor tatters or to me, "'had it not been for her exceeding pride in our family tree. "'The second reason for my disadvantage before her was her utter contempt for my profession as a composer of popular music. Today her voice came thinly to me across the long-distance wire. "'Your cousin Phillida has failed in her examinations again,' she announced to me with a species of tragic repose. "'In view of her father's intellect and my, or my family's, her mental status is inexplicable.' "'Although, of course, there is your own case.' "'Why, she is the most educated girl I know,' I protested hastily. "'I presume you mean best educated, Roger. "'Pray do not quite lose your command of language.' "'I meant exactly what I had said. "'Phillida has studied since she was three years old, "'exhaustively and exhaustedly. A vision of her plain, pale little face rose before me when I spoke. It is a burden to be the only child of a professor, particularly for a meek girl. She has studied insufficiently, Aunt Caroline pursued. She is nineteen, and her position at Vassar is deplorable. Her health, I murmured, would not have hampered her, had she given proper attention to athletics. However, I did not call up to hear you defend Phillida in a matter of which you are necessarily ignorant. Her father and I are somewhat better judges, I should suppose, than a young man who is not a student in any true sense of the word and ignores knowledge as a purpose in life. Not that I wish to wound or depreciate you, Roger. There is, I may say, a steadiness of moral character beneath your frivolity of mind and pursuit. If my poor brother had trained you more wisely, if you had been my son... Thank you, aunt. I acknowledged the benevolent intention, with an inward quailing at the clank of fetters suggested. Was there something I can do for you? Will you meet Phillida at the Grand Central and bring her home? I cannot have her cross New York alone and take a second train out here. Her father has a lecture this afternoon, and I have a club meeting at the house. With pleasure, aunt. What time does her train get in? Half after four. Thank you, Roger. And she looks on you as an elder brother. I believe an attitude of cool disapproval on your part might impress upon her how she has disappointed the family. Leave it to me, aunt. May I take her to tea, between trains, and get out to your place on the six o'clock express? If you think best, 
You might advise her seriously over the tea. A dash of lemon, as it were, I reflected. Certainly, aunt, I could. Very well. I am really obliged. The pleasure is mine, aunt. But that it was going to be Phillida's, I had already decided. She would need the support of tea and French pastry before facing her home. As for treating her with cool disapproval, I would sooner have spent a year at Vassar myself. It was my intention to meet her with a box of chocolates instead of advice. Phil was not allowed candy her complexion being under cultivation. On the occasions when we were out together, it had been my custom to provide a box of sweets, upon which she browsed luxuriously, bestowing the remnants upon some street child before reaching her home. From the telephone I turned back to that frivolous pursuit of which my aunt had spoken with such tactfully veiled contempt. She was not softened by the respectable fortune I had made from several successful musical comedies and a number of efforts which my publishers advertise as high-class parlor pieces for the home. In fact, she felt it to be a grievance that my lightness should be better paid than the professor's learning, in which she was no doubt right. Ever since my return from my newly purchased farm in Connecticut, however, I had not been working for money or popular approval, but for my own pleasure. There was a work upon which I spent only special hours of delicious leisure and infinite labor. It held all that was forbidden to popular compositions, depth and sorrow and dissonances dearer than harmony. I called it a symphony Polynesian, and I had spent years in study of barbaric music, instruments and kindred things that this love child of mine might be more richly clothed by a tone or a fancy. Aunt Caroline had interrupted this morning at a very point of achievement toward which I had been working through the usual alterations of enjoyment and exasperation, elevation and dejection that attend most workmen. Pausing only to set my alarm clock, I hurried into recording what I had found in the tangible form of paper and ink. I always set the alarm clock when I have an engagement, warned by dire experiences. Aunt Caroline had summoned me about eleven in the morning. When the strident voice of the clock again aroused me, I had just time to dress and reach the Grand Central by half-past four. I recognized that I was hungry, that the vicinity was snowed over with sheets of paper, that the piano keys had acquired another ink stain, and my pipe had charred another black spot on the desktop. Well, it had been a good day, and Phillida's tea would have to be my belated luncheon or early dinner. Even so, it was necessary to make haste. It was in that haste of making ready that I uncovered the braid of glittering hair which I had brought from Connecticut. I use no exaggeration when I say it glittered. It did. Each hair was lustrous with a peculiar, shining vitality, and crinkled slightly along its full length. With a renewed self-reproach at sight of its humbled exile and captivity, I took up the trophy of my one adventure. While I am without much experience, such a quantity seemed unusual. Also, I had not known such a mass of hair could be so soft and supple in the hand. My mother and little sister died before I can remember, and while I have many good friends, I have none intimate enough to educate me in such matters. Perhaps a consciousness of that trifling physical disadvantage of mine has made me prefer a good deal of solitude in my hours at home. The faint, tenacious, yet volatile perfume drifted to my nostrils as I held the braid. Who could the woman be who brought that costly fragrance into a deserted farmhouse? For so exquisite and unique a fragrance could only be the work of a master perfumer. 
There was youth in that vigorous hair, coquetry in the individual perfume, panic in her useless sacrifice of the braid I held. Yet strangest self-possession in the telling of that fanciful tale of sorcery to me. On that tale, told dramatically in the dark, I had next morning blamed the weird waking nightmare that I had suffered after her visit. The horror of the night could not endure the strong sun and wind of the March morning that followed. Like Scrooge, I analyzed my ghost as a bit of undigested beef or a blot of mustard. Certainly the thing had been actual enough while it lasted, but my reason had thrust it away. That was over, I reflected, as I laid the braid back in the drawer. But surely the lady was not vanished like the nightmare? Surely I should find her in some neighbor's daughter, when my house was finished and I went there for the summer? She could not hide from me with that bright web about her head whose twin web I held. It had grown so late that I had to take a taxicab to the terminal, just halting at a shop long enough to buy a box of the chocolates my cousin preferred. But when I reached the great station and found my way through the swirl of travelers to the track where Phil's train should come in, I was told the express had been delayed. "'Probably half an hour late,' the gateman informed me. "'Maybe more. Of course, though, she may pull in at any time.' Which meant no tea for Phillida. Instead, a rush across town to the Pennsylvania station to catch the train for her home. As I could not leave my post lest she arrive in my absence, it also meant nothing to eat for me until we reached Aunt Carolyn's hospitality, which was cool and restrained rather than festive. I foresaw the heavy atmosphere that would brood over all like a cold fog, this evening of Phil's disgraceful return from the scholastic arena. Ascertaining from the gate men that the erring train was certain not to pull in during the next ten minutes, I sought a telephone booth. "'Aunt Carolyn, Phil's train is going to be very late, possibly an hour late,' I misinformed my kinswoman when her voice answered me. "'I have had nothing to eat since breakfast, and she will be hungry long before we reach your house. May I not take her to dinner here in town?' "'Please do not call your cousin Phil,' she rebuked me, and paused to deliberate. "'You had no luncheon, you say?' "'None.' "'Why not? Were you ill?' "'No, just busy. I forgot lunch. I'm beginning to feel it now. Still, if you wish us to come straight home, do not consider me.' I knew of old how submission mollified Aunt Caroline. She relented now. "'Well, you are very good, Roger, to save your uncle a trip into the city to meet her. I must not impose upon you. But a quiet hotel.' "'Certainly, Aunt. Phillida does not deserve pampering enjoyment. I am consenting for your sake.' "'Thank you, Aunt.' I wonder, then, if you would mind if we stop to see a show that I especially want to look over, for business reasons. We would come out on the Theatre Express, as we have done before, you remember. Yes, but... Thank you. I'll take good care of her. Goodbye. The receiver was still talking when I hung up. There is no other form of conversation so incomparably convenient. The train arrived within the half hour. With the inrush of travelers, I sighted Phillida's sober young figure moving along the cement platform. She walked with dejection. Her gray suit represented a compromise between fashion and her mother's opinion of decorum, thus attaining a length and fullness not enough for grace yet too much for jauntiness. Her solemn gray hat was set too squarely upon the pale brown hair, brushed back from her forehead. 
Her nice, young girl's eyes looked out through a pair of shell-rimmed spectacles. She was too thin and too pale to content me. When she saw me coming toward her, her face brightened and colored quite warmly. She waved her bag with actual abandon, and her lagging step quickened to a run. "'Cousin Roger!' she exclaimed breathlessly. "'Oh, how good of you to come!' She gripped my hands in a candid fervor of relief and pleasure. "'I am so glad it is you,' she insisted. "'I was sorry the train could not be later. I wished almost it would never get in, and all the time it was you who were waiting for me.' "'It was, and now you are about to share an orgy,' I told her. "'I have your mother's permission to take you to dinner, Miss Knox.' "'Here? In town? Just us?' "'Yes.' and afterward we will take in any show you fancy. How does that strike you?" She gazed up at me, absorbing the idea and my seriousness. To my dismay, she grew pale again. I, I really believe it'll keep me from just dying. I pretended to think that a joke, but I recognized that my little cousin was on the sloping way toward a nervous breakdown. "'No baggage?' I observed. "'Good. I hope you did not eat too much luncheon. This will be an early dinner.' She waited to take off the spectacles and put them in her little bag. "'I do not need them except to study, but I didn't dare meet Mother without them,' she explained. "'No, I could not eat lunch or breakfast either, Cousin Roger, nor much dinner last night.' Oh, if you knew how I dread the grind, I should rather run away. So we will, for this evening. Yes. Where? Where were you going to take me? We had crossed the great white hall to street level, and a taxicab was rolling up to halt before us. Surprised by the anxiety in the eyes she lifted to mine, I named the staid quietly fastidious hotel where I usually took her when we were permitted an excursion together. "'Unless you have a choice,' I finished. "'I have,' she breathed resolution. "'I want to go to a restaurant with a cabaret instead of going to the theater. May I? Please, may I? Will you take me where I say, this one time?' Her earnestness amazed me. I knew what her mother would say. I also knew, or thought I knew, that Phillida needed the mental relaxation which comes from having one's own way. In her mood, no one else's way, however wise or agreeable, will do it all. All right, I yielded, if you will promise me, faith of a gentlewoman, to tell Aunt Carolyn that I took you there and you did not know where you were going. My shoulders are broader than yours and have borne the buffeting of thirty-two years instead of nineteen. Had you chosen the place, or shall I? To my second surprise, she answered with the name of an uptown place where I never had been and where I would have decidedly preferred not to take her. They have a skating ballet, she urged, as I hesitated. I know it is wonderful. Please, please. I gave the direction to the chauffeur and followed my cousin into the cab. It seemed a proper moment to present the chocolates from my overcoat pocket. When she proved too languid to unwrap the box, I was seriously uneasy. You cannot possibly know how dreadful it is to be the only child of two intellectual people who expect one to be a credit, she excused her lack of appetite, nervously twitching the gilt cord about the package. And to be stupid and a disappointment. Yes, as long as I can remember, I have been a disappointment. If only there had been another to divide all those expectations. If only you had been my brother. "'Heaven forbid!' I exclaimed hastily. 
That is... Don't bother about explaining, she smiled wanly. I understand. But you are distinguished, and you look it. I never will be, and I am ugly. Mother expects me to be an astronomer like father and work with him, or to go in for club life and serious writing as she does. I never can do either. Neither could I, Phil. You are clever, successful. Everybody knows your name. When we are out and people or an orchestra play your music, Mother always says, A trifle of my nephew's, Roger Locke. Very original, is it not? Of course, I do not understand music, but I hear that his last light opera. And then she leans back and just eats up all the nice things said about your work. She would never let you know it, but she does. And that is the sort of thing she wants from me. I, I want to make cookies, and I love fancy work. The taxicab drew up with a jerk before the gaudy entrance to Silver Isles. I imagine Phillida had the vaguest ideas of what such places were like. When we were settled at a table in a general blaze of pink lights, Beside a fountain that ran colored water, I regarded her humorously. But she seemed quite contented with her surroundings, looking about her with an air I can best describe as grave excitement. At this hour, the room was not half filled, and the jazz orchestra had withdrawn to prepare for a hard night's work. After I had ordered our dinner, I glanced up to see her fingers busied, loosening the severe lines of her brushed back hair. "'Everyone here looks so nice,' she said wistfully. "'I wish my hair did shine and cuddle around my face like those women's does. "'Do—do do I look queer, cousin? "'You're looking at me so—' "'I was thinking what pretty eyes you have.' Her pale face flushed. Really? Most truthfully. As for the hair, isn't that a matter of bottled polish and hairdressers? But you remind me of a question for you. Isn't a braid of hair this wide, I laid off the dimensions on the table, this long and thick, a good deal for a woman to own? Show me again. I obeyed while she leaned forward to observe. Not one girl in a hundred has so much, she pronounced judgment. Who is she? Probably it isn't all her own, anyhow. It is not now, but it was, I said remorsefully. How could you tell? Did you measure it? With sarcasm. Do you remember the maxim we used to write in copy books? Measure a thousand times and cut once? One has to be cautious. I cut it first, and then measured. What? Tell me. At last she was interested and amused. There was no reason why I should not tell her of my midnight adventure. We never repeated one another's little confidences. She listened, with many comments and exclamations, to the story of the unseen lady, the legend of the fair witch, the dagger that was a paper knife by day, and the severed tresses. She did not hear of the singular nightmare or hallucination that had been my second visitor. My reason had accounted for the experience and dismissed it. Some other part of myself avoided the memory, with that deep, unreasoning sense of horror sometimes left by a morbid dream. The dinner crowd had flowed in while we ate and talked. A burst of applause aroused me to this fact, and the commencement of the first show of the evening. The orchestra had taken their places. "'They will hardly begin with their best act,' I remarked, surprised by Phillida's convulsive start and rapt intentness upon the stretch of ice that formed the exhibition floor." Your ballet on skates probably will come later. 
"'I did not come to see the ballet,' she answered, her voice low. "'No? What, then?' "'A man I know.' "'Once, when I was a little fellow, I raced headlong into the low-swinging branch of a tree, the bow striking me across the forehead so that I was bowled over backward amid a shower of apples. I felt a twin sensation now. "'Here, Phillida?' "'Yes.' "'Someone from your hometown or your college town?' I essayed a casual tone. "'Neither. He belongs here, and they call him Flying Veer. He—' "'Look, look, cousin!' I turned and saw that the first performer was upon the ice floor. He came down the center like a silver-shod mercury. In the silence, for the orchestra did not accompany his entrance, the faint musical ringing of his skates ran softly with him. My first unwilling recognition of his good looks and athletic grace was followed by an equally reluctant admission of his skill. Reluctant because my anger and bewilderment were hot against the man. My little cousin, my pathetic, unworldly Phillida, and this cabaret entertainer? At the mere joining of their names, my senses revolted. What could they have in common? How had she seen him? Having seen him, it was easy to understand how he had fascinated her in experience. Only, what was his object? He had seen us where we sat. I saw his dark eyes fix upon her and flash some message. Her plain little face irradiated, her fingers unconsciously twisting and wringing her napkin. She leaned forward to watch and answer, glance for glance. I would rather not put into words my thoughts. Yet I watched his performance. In spite of myself, he held me with his swift, certain skill, his vitality and youth. He was gone with the swooping suddenness of his appearance. The jazz music clattered out. Phillida turned back to me and began to speak with a hushed rapture that baffled and infuriated me. "'You understand, Cousin Roger?' Now that you have seen him, you do understand? No, let me talk, please. Let me tell you if I can. It began last summer at the school where I was cramming for college work. Oh, how tired I was of study. How tired of it I am, and always shall be. I think that side of me never will get rested. Then, in the woods, I met him. He was stopping at a hotel not far away. I, we, I waited for her to go on. Instead, she abruptly spread wide her hands in a gesture of helplessness. After all, I cannot tell you. Not even you, cousin. He, he liked me. He treated me just as a really, truly girl who would have partners at dances and wear fluffy frocks and curl her hair. He thought I was pretty. The naive wonder and triumph of her cry, the challenge in her brown eyes, to my belief, were moving things. I registered some ugly mental comments on the rearing of Phil and the kind of humility that is not good for the soul. Why not? I demanded. Of course. She shook her head. No, thank you, but no. Not pretty, except to him. Only to him, because he loves me. I do not know what impatience I exclaimed. She checked me, leaning across the table to grasp my hands in both hers. Hush, oh hush, dear cousin Roger, for it is quite too late. We were married six months ago, last autumn. When I could, I asked, Married legally, beyond mistake? 
Were you not under eighteen years old? I was eighteen years and a half. There is no mistake at all. We walked over to the city hall in the nearest town and took out our license and were married. Very well. I will take you home to your father and mother, now. Then see this man myself. If there is indeed no flaw in the marriage, and it cannot be annulled, a divorce must be arranged. Any money I have, or expect to have, would be a small price to set you free from the miserable business. But the first thing is to get you home. We will start now. She detained my hand when I would have signaled our waiter. Her eyes, shining and solemn as a small child's, met mine. No, cousin, please. I am not going home any more. At least not alone. I asked you to bring me here where he is, because I am going to stay with my husband. Never, I stated firmly. Yes. Not if I have to send for your father and take you home by force. You cannot. I am of age. Phillida, I am responsible for you to your parents tonight. Let me take you home, explain things to them, and then decide your course. But that is what I most do not want to do, she naively exclaimed. You will not? I am sorry, no. Then I must see the man. Not hurt. I recalled the man we had just seen on the skating floor with a qualm of quite unreasonable bitterness. That anxiety of Phillida's had a flavor of irony for me. Hardly, I returned. There are fortunately other means of persuasion than physical force. Oh, but you cannot persuade him to give me up. I was silent at which, being a woman, she grew troubled. "'How could you?' she urged. "'You have had no opportunity of judging what influence money has on some people, Phil.' She laughed out in relief. "'Is that all? Try, cousin.' "'You trust him so much?' "'In everything, forever.' Then, if I succeed in buying him off, promise me that you will come home with me? If he takes money to leave me? Yes. I should die. But I will promise if you want me to, because I know it never will happen. Just as I might promise to do anything when I knew that I never would have to carry it out. Very well. I accepted the best I could get. I will go find him. There is no need. He is coming here to our table as soon as he is free. I will not have you seen with him in this place. But I am going to stay here with him, she said. Her eyes, the meek eyes of Phillida, defied me. My faint authority was a sham. What could be done, I recognized, must be done through the man. We sat in silence after that. Presently her gaze fixed a slant on me as if to dare my interference. She drew up a thin gold chain that hung about her neck and ended beneath her blouse. From it she unfastened a wedding ring and gravely put the thing on her third finger the schoolgirl romanticism of the gesture, blended with an air of little-girl naughtiness. She looked more fit for a nursery than for this business. I could tell from the change in her expression when the man was approaching. I rose, meaning to meet him and turn him aside from our table. But Phillida halted me with one deftly planted question. You would not leave me alone in this place, cousin? Certainly I would not leave her alone at a table here, 
not even alone in appearance while I had my interview with the man close at hand. Yet it seemed impossible to speak before her. She calmly answered my perplexity. You must talk to him here, of course. I want to listen to you both. Indeed, I shall not interfere at all, or be angry or hurt. I know how good you mean to be, dear. Only you do not understand. I sat down again, perforce. When the man's shadow presently fell across our table, it did not soothe me to see Phil thrust her hand in his, her small face enraptured, her fingers locking about his with a caress plain as a kiss. She said proudly, if tremulously, "'Cousin Roger, this is my husband. "'Mr. Locke, Ethan, dear.' "'He said nothing. "'His hesitating movement to offer his hand I chose to ignore. "'I admit that my spirit rose against him to the point of loathing as he stood there, "'tall, correct in attire, "'the focus of admiring glances from other diners, in every way the antithesis of my poor Phillida. Sit down, I bade curtly, when he did not speak. Miss Knox insists that we have our interview here. I should have preferred otherwise, but her presence must not prevent what has to be said. It won't prevent anything I want to say, Mr. Locke, he answered. He spoke with a drawl not the drawl of affectation, nor the drawl of south or west so cherished by the romantic, but the slow, deliberate speech of New England's upper coasts. It had the oddest effect, that honest, homely accent on the lips of a performer in this place. Phil drew him down to the third chair at the table, after which she folded her hands on the edge of the cloth as if to signify to me how she kept her promise of neutrality and looked fixedly at her glass of water instead of at either of us. Plainly, all action was supposed to proceed from me. "'My cousin has just told me of her marriage,' I opened, as dryly concise as I could manage explanation. "'It is, of course, impossible that she should adopt your way of living,' as she seems to have in mind. You may not understand yet that it also is impossible for you to adopt hers. No doubt you have supposed her to be the daughter of wealthy people, or at least people of whom money could be obtained. You were wrong. Professor Knox has nothing but his modest salary. Her parents are of the scholarly, not of the moneyed class. She has no kin who could or would support her husband, or pay largely to be rid of him. Of all her people, I happen to be the best off, financially. It happens also that I am not sentimental, nor alarmed at the idea of newspaper exploitation for either of us. It is necessary that all this be plainly set forth before we go further. Now, for your side, you have involved Miss Knox to the extent of marriage. To free her from this trap into which her inexperience has walked is worth a reasonable price. I will pay it. I shall take her home to her father and mother tonight and consult my lawyer tomorrow. He will conduct negotiations with you. The day Miss Knox is divorced from you without useless scandal or trouble-making, I will pay to you the sum agreed upon with my lawyer. If you prefer to make yourself objectionable, you will get nothing, now or later. He took it all without a flicker of the eyelids, not interrupting or displaying any affectation of being insulted. I acknowledge now that it was an outrageous speech to make to a man of whom I knew nothing. But it was so intended, summing up what I considered an outrageous situation brought about by his playing upon a young girl's ignorance of such fellows as himself. 
Phillida's usually pale cheeks were burning. Several times she would have broken in upon me with protests, if Vere had not silenced her by the merest glances of warning. A proof of his influence over her which had not inclined me toward gentleness with him. When I finished, there was a pause before he turned his dark eyes to mine and held them there. "'Honest enough,' he drawled, with that incongruous coast of Maine tang to his leisureness. "'I'll match you there, Mr. Locke. I don't care whether you make fifty thousand a year with your music writing, or whether you grind a street piano with a tin cup on top. It's nothing to me. I guess we can do without your lawyer, too. Because, you see, I married Mrs. Vere because I wanted her, and I figure on supporting her. If her folks are too cultivated to stand me, I'm sorry. But they won't have to see me. So that's settled. He was honest. His glance drove that fact home to me with a fist-like impact. There was nothing I was so poorly prepared to meet. Phillida's hands went out to him in an impulsive movement. He covered them both with one of his for a moment, before gently putting them in her lap with a gesture of reminder toward the revelers all about us. The delicacy of that thought for her was another disclosure of character, unconsciously made. Worthy or unworthy, he did love Phil. I am not too dully obstinate to recognize a mistake of my own. Whatever my bitterness against the man, I had to accord him some respect. I sat for a while striving to align my forces to attack this new front. "'I don't blame you for thinking what you said, Mr. Locke,' his voice presently spoke across my perplexity. I can see the way things came to you, finding me here and all. I'm glad to have had this chance to talk it out with one of my wife's relations. I'd like them to know she'll be taken care of. Outside of that, I guess there is nothing we have to say to each other. I suppose I owe you both an apology, I said stiffly. Oh, that's all right, for both of us. I can see how much store you set by her. But what are you going to do with her, man? I burst forth. Do you expect to keep her here, sitting at a table in this place and watching you do your turn, making your fellow performers her friends, seeing and learning? I checked my outpouring of disgust. Or do you propose to shut her up in some third-class boarding-house day and night while you hang around here? Good heavens, Vere, do you realize what either life would be for a nineteen-year-old girl brought up as she has been? He colored. As for bringing up, he retorted, I guess she couldn't be a lot more miserable than her folks worried her into being. But you're right about the rest. That's why I was going to leave her with her folks yet a while, until I had a place for her. I mean, while I saved up enough to get the place. But I wrote to him when I failed in my exams, Cousin Roger, Phillida broke in. I told him that I would not go home. I could not bear it. I was coming to him, and he would just have to keep me with him, or I should die. Indeed, I do not care about places. I think it will be lovely fun to sit here and watch him, or go behind the scenes with him and make friends with the other people. I, I am surprised that you are so narrow, Cousin Roger, when all your own best friends are theatrical people and artists and you think so highly of them. I answered nothing to that. The distance between the stage and this class of cabaret show was not to be traversed in a few seven-league words. I looked at Vere, who returned my look squarely and soberly. "'You needn't worry about her being here, Mr. Locke,' he said. 
I know better than that. But she has to come to me. It's her right, don't you think? I'll promise you to take her to a better place as soon as I can manage. What kind of place? I'm saving to get a place in the country, he answered diffidently. I'm a countryman, and Phillida thinks she'd like it. You? I exclaimed, unable to smother my derision and unbelief. My glance summed up his fastidious apparel and grooming, the gloss on his curling dark hair and the dubious diamond on his little finger. He reddened through his clear dark skin, but his eyes were not those of a man taken in a lie. "'Did you take notice of what I do here?' he asked me, with the first touch of humility I had seen in him. "'I couldn't dance or sing or do parlor tricks. I wasn't bred to parlors or indoors, but I learned to skate pretty fancy from a boy up. My folks' farm was on the side of a lake and the schoolhouse on the other. About November that lake used to freeze solid. My brother and I used to skate five miles to school and back again, before we were six years old. We lived on skates about half the year, I guess. Well, you don't care about the rest, how the farm was just about big enough to support my elder brother and his family, and I came to New York nor how I found New York pretty well filled up with folks who knew considerably more than I did. It was the manager of this place who advertised for expert skaters, who dressed me up like this, and paid me the first living wages I'd had in the city. All the same, I was bred a farmer, and I mean to get back to it. Always have. You're a man, Mr. Locke and I'd hate you to think I was a shimmy dancer on ice and nothing else, or I wouldn't mention it. My father would have taken the buggy whip to me, I guess, if he had lived to see me in this rig. Soon as I've got enough put by, I'll shed this perfumed suit and the cheap jewelry and take my wife where she can have a chance to forget I ever wore them. But I like them, put in Phillida ardently. Please do not fuss so, Ethan, because I really do. Do you? I turned upon her. Are you sure, then, that it is not all this cabaret glamour you really are in love with? Would you care for him as an ordinary, hard-working fellow, in a pair of overalls and a flannel shirt? No applause, no lights, no stage? She laughed up at me. You have forgotten that I met Ethan while he was on a vacation from his work here, and roughing it. When I married him, I had hardly seen him in anything except his navy flannel shirt, scrubby trousers, and funny blunt-toed shoes. You served in the war? I asked him. He nodded. Yes, on a submarine chaser got pneumonia from exposure and was invalidated home just before the armistice. And you came back here? I came here, he corrected me. I enlisted from Maine. I was discharged in New York. That was when I couldn't find anything I could do until this skating trick came along. I sat thinking for a time, as long thoughts as I could command. The obvious course was to send for Phillida's father. Yet what could that vague and learned gentleman do that I could not? I visioned the professor standing in this riotous, gaudy restaurant, swinging his eyeglasses by their silk ribbon and peering at Vere in helpless distaste and consternation. It was practically certain that Phil would refuse to go home with him. What if she did go home? I could picture the scene there when the truth came out. The mortification of her people, the gossip in the little town, her outcast position among the girls and boys with whom she had grown up. What a martyrdom for a sensitive spirit! 
Of course, the only possible thing considered by Aunt Caroline would be a prompt divorce. If Phillida refused to consent to a divorce, how could she live at home as the wife of a man her parents had pronounced unfit to receive? If she yielded and gave up Vere, would she be much better off? An embarrassment to her family, the heroine of a stolen marriage and Reno freedom, what chances of happiness would she have in her conventional circle? Especially as she neither was a beauty nor the dashing type of girl who might make capital of such a reputation. Probably she would bury herself in nun-like seclusion, stay in her room when callers came, and wear a veil when she went out to walk. Meanwhile she would break her heart for Veer. Could matters be any worse if she tried life with him, even if the experiment eventually proved a failure and ended in a divorce instead of beginning there? Might not her parents be spared much they most dreaded if their friends could be told simply that Phillida had made a love match and was with her husband? Finally, Phillida was a human creature with the right to manage her own life. Had any of us the right to lay hands upon her existence and mold it to our fancy? I looked up from my reverie to find the eyes of both of them fixed on me as if I held their doom balanced upon my palm. Perhaps, in a sense, I did. Phil, will you come home to your father and mother and consider all this a bit more before you decide? I asked her. I thought I knew the answer to this, and I did. No, Cousin Roger, she refused firmly. Please forgive me. I know how kind you mean to be, but no. I shall stay with Ethan. If ever you love anyone, you will understand. I accepted the decision. There was no reason why I should think of the woman who had spoken to me across the darkness in a voice of melody and power, or why I should seem to feel again the exquisite, live softness of her braid within my hand. But it was so. Very well, I said. Veer, it is to you, then, as Phillida's husband, that I must address any plans. I do not pretend to like the course she has taken. I do not know what action her parents may take although I believe they will listen to my advice. Putting all that aside, she refuses to come with me, and you agree that she cannot stay here. I have just bought a farm in Connecticut, intending to use it as a summer home. There are some alterations and repairs being made, but little is to be changed inside the house, and it is in perfectly livable shape. Here is my offer. Take Phillida there, and I will make you manager of the place. I will pay all reasonable expenses of putting the land into proper condition and getting such stock and equipment as you judge best, all expenses and upkeep of the house, and whatever salary usually is drawn by such managers of small estates. I shall be there, on and off, but you and Phillida must take charge of everything. I am neither a farmer nor a housekeeper, and do not wish to be either. I bought the place only because New York is too hot to work in during three months of the year, and I hate summer resorts. Keep my room ready, and you will find I disturb you little. Of course, hire what servants are necessary. Now, if you make the place self-supporting inside of five years, I will deed the whole thing to you, too. To put it better, if you succeed in making the farm pay a living for yourselves, I will make it over to you and withdraw. If you fail, well, I suppose you will be no worse off than you are now. They were stricken speechless. Perhaps my attitude had not pointed to such a conclusion of our interview. Phillida told me long afterward 
that she expected me to bid them good evening and abandon them forever as my mildest course, with alternative possibilities such as summoning a policeman and having Vere hailed to prison. Seeing their condition, I rose. I will stroll about and leave you a chance to talk it over, I declared, although there are few ordeals I dislike more than displaying my limp about such public rooms. Vere stopped me, rising as I rose. No need of that for us, he answered, facing me across the little table. About giving us your farm, Mr. Locke, that's for the future. Just now, the manager's job is plenty big enough to thank you for. I wish I could say it better. If you'll stay here with Phillida for ten minutes until I can get back, I'll be obliged. Where are you going? To resign here and get my outfit into a suitcase. He had taken up my challenge like a man, at least. There were none of the hesitations and excuses to stay in town that I had half expected. It pleased me that he decided for Phil as well as himself. Some of my ideas about marriage are antiquated, I admit. I nodded to him and sat down again. It is unnecessary to record the childish things Phillida tried to say to me while he was gone. I am so happy, was her apology for threatened tears. I never knew anyone except Ethan could be so kind. And, and will you tell father and mother? Yes. I winced, though, at that prospect. Give me that little bag you carry on your wrist. She obeyed, wide-eyed. You do tote a powder puff. I did not know whether Aunt Carolyn permitted it. Rub it on your nose, I advised, passing the bit of fluff to her. While she complied, almost like a normally frivolous girl, I used the moment to transfer a few banknotes to the bag so some need might not find her penniless. Vere came back in not much more than the promised ten minutes. He had changed to gray street clothes and carried a suitcase. I noted that the diamond had disappeared from his finger, and his curly head looked as if it had been held under a water faucet and vigorously toweled to lessen the brilliantine gloss. "'If you'll tell us where your farm is, Mr. Locke, we'll start,' he volunteered. Phillida looked up at him with eyes of adoring trust. "'I had the porter at the terminal check my suitcase to be called for. We shall have to get it, dear.' In spite of myself, I smiled at their amazing promptitude. There was both reassurance and pathos in its unconscious youth. All this eagerness pressing forward. Where? They did not know, nor I. Certainly we did not dream how strange a goal awaited one of us three, or on what weird, desolate path that traveler's foot was already set. "'You had better go to a good hotel for tonight,' I modified their plan. "'Tomorrow is time enough to go out to the farm, by daylight. Phil has had enough excitement for one day. I will write full directions for the trip.' Veer on the back of this timetable of the railroad you must take. They were enchanted with this suggestion. Indeed, they were in a state of mind to have assented if I advised them to sit out on a park bench until morning. Yet, when I had put them and their scanty luggage into a taxicab, I suffered a bad pang of misgiving. What responsibility was I assuming in letting my little girl cousin go like this? What did I know of this man, or where he would take her? I think Phillida divined something of my trouble, for she leaned out the door to me and held up her face like a child's to be kissed. "'I am so happy,' she whispered. I turned to Vere, who had a long envelope in readiness to put in my hand. I guess you might like to have these for a while, Mr. Locke, he said, 
with one of his slow, straightforward glances, with which farewells I had to be content, and watch their taxi swing out into the bright dark flow of traffic, where it was lost from my sight. After which I entered another taxicab by my unromantic self, and was driven to that railroad station where I would find a train bound to the college town that was the home of Aunt Caroline and her husband. One always thought of Phil's parents in that order, although the professor was a moderately distinguished scientist, and his spouse merely masterful in her own limited circle. The envelope Vere had given me contained their marriage certificate, his release from the Navy, and his membership card in the American Legion. End of chapter 3 Recording by Roger Moline